Okay, so we're here with Danny at Marvel's Koi uh, on the new podcast series, which is called Chronicles: Tales of Koi Keeping from Around the World. Um, don't actually know when this is going to drop yet, whether or not it's going to be uh, the first, second, fourth, or even last. Who knows? Um, but you've come down. Um, obviously, as a friend, but as a Koi dealer as well now. Yeah. Um, so we kind of figured we'd start this journey off from a sort of YouTuber to sort of koi keeper so for those that don't know obviously i'm bald and reefer uh this is uh danny uh my boys koi um you've got a youtube channel yeah so my boys koi um started it last year after i had my little baby boy and um it was just he loved fish and so i bought him a little little 10 pound tank off facebook marketplace and got some guppies um they didn't last long and then i built a little pond and got some metacarp, tuitions, uh, tents, just all kinds. Then start to learn a little bit more about it. And then also discovered that you can't see any of them in the bottom of the pond. Very true. So went and got a couple of koi garden centre and I done what everyone think I think a lot of people are doing. I went garden centre to garden centre and just bought one fish here, two fish there and literally created a haven for parasites essentially because I was picking them up from anywhere and everywhere and so yeah so that was a problem I was still in a cave and then I realised that my pond I think it was about 700 litres the first one I built and too small wasn't big enough built another one that bowed built another one and yeah <laughs> until it ended up um, taking over my life I think Touching back on your point of getting koi from anywhere and everywhere, I think that's how a lot of people start out in the yeah. industry, is they'll search like, well, you used to be able to search on Facebook Marketplace and places like that, uh, Gumtree and stuff, and I was murdered for it when I first started my sort of pond keeping pre YouTube days. I'd look at it and think, wow, like, Darley's down the road, he's closing down a pond, she's got 15 koi in there that are 60 centimetres in size, I can grab them because they're free and I can put them in my pond one of the worst and biggest mistakes I think I ever made as a koi keeper was thinking that I could save those fish and I, I could bring those fish back to full health because the amount that it actually physically takes if it is that you pick those koi up with a problem is absolutely unreal like it is ludicrous because you, half the time you don't even know what you're battling especially when you've gone round to see George, Doris and Margaret and you've got koi from all three ponds and it's you go into a garden centre and you're just looking at the pretty fish aren't you? Like, I like the orange one, I like the black one, you don't really know what they are. You can see there's one dead in the corner or one that looks like it's seen better days and you're still buying the fish and it, and it, causes, it causes issues that you don't really know. But, but that's, where, that's where it started anyway and then very rapidly I built a pond and then I realised that having a pond is a nice thing to do but then if you want to really grow fish on and have bigger fish as well you need two ponds so then I have a second pond and yeah it, it just spiralled I think I've got seven now um, so yeah it's crazy to think like where you sort of sorted from to sort of where you are now because I mean I know it's been already touched on before on, on the podcast it was like podcast it was on, on, the, on the YouTube channel and stuff but obviously there was uh, obviously it's a no old pod, podcast yeah, yeah. Um, I know it was touched on previously that you're a little bit of a naughty boy in the past. Yeah. Back then, could you see yourself now if somebody said you're going to be a koi so, dealer in North Wales, living next to a mountain, yeah, that, that living was, your best life? Could you have ever have seen it happening? I, I wanted it all. When I was younger, I wanted it all. Um, I was from, obviously, a little council estate in Liverpool. My mum and dad just normal work and people. We didn't have a lot, but, you know, I didn't have it rough either. I never. I, I always make sure to say that because I'm not going to pretend that I, I scrounged growing up. I didn't, but we didn't have it all. We, you know, we, we were just normal working class people. And I wanted more, and I've always wanted more. And I had my first business at 16, and I got into crime at 16, 17, and before I knew it, I was a part of millions of pounds with the drug deals. And, and it's not that I'm proud of, I do say it because I, I feel like why. I should say it, you know what I mean, if I can change one person, if I change one person's perspective, then I feel like I should do that, but at the age of 19, I was sat with Colombians and all kinds of stuff in place in Amsterdam and Marbella and whatever, and I really thought that, um, yeah, I really thought I knew what I was doing, and I was a stupid kid, I'll be honest, so I ended up in prison when I was 20, 
I got 28 months, then I got back out and within 24 hours I was at it again. And then I got six years, nine months, and on that sentence, um, I've done a warehouse at Cheshire Dog Zone, um, volunteers now, helping them clean kennels and pick up dog shit essentially. And I chose to do that, and I've done that for a year, and on that I, I met Becky, and she said to me like... Rosa told no, Becky's his partner now. Becky, sorry, yeah, <laughs> Becky's me, me um, fiance, we've got Mikey together. Um, so yeah, so I met Becky and, and then she said to me, look, if you want to be with me and you want to stay with me, then you've got to knock all that on the head. Because as much as I never wanted to really do crime, I wanted money. I think like we all want money and, and I chose an easy option, which trust me, it's not an easy option. Um, from three, four and a half years in total in prison, from seven prisons, some of them twice. I've been picked up, manhandled, had dogs set on me and whatever by the prison officers. Um, I laugh about it now, but obviously at the time it was a scary, a scary thing. It's not nice. I've still got mates who are doing that them same sentences now, which you know my heart goes out to some of them, and some of them I wish I had shaken. They wouldn't do it anymore. But that's where I started. So I started not like everyone else, but when so, I had the baby, I found fun. So how do how do you feel? Obviously, with the, with the whole YouTube side of things, then going back to that before we touch on the sort of coy dealer side of things. How did it make you feel knowing that this was aired and it wasn't you that aired it? Do you know what I mean? That YouTube yeah. sort of forced so, that confession out ahead of so well, For those, who, for those but, who don't know, um, I've never hid my past, I've never hid it, but I don't shout about it either. I always said one day when I make it, when I make it and I'm, I'm a millionaire and I've done well, and hopefully I get to that point, but once, one day I'll go down schools, I'll help kids, but a lot of people try to teach me and, and, and tell me how to, how to be. But I used to think, but you're a no one, you've got no money. So I always never wanted to be that person who was like, listen to what I say, but I've never actually made it, do you know what I mean? And then someone um, Googled my name for whatever reason and found out that uh, I've been in prison and I was a part of crime groups and whatever, whatever you want to call it. We were a group of mates, people called us gangs, whatever. We, I was just a group of mates. But anyway, someone Googled it and put it out there for the world to see. So I got a heads up of someone who still never disclosed, who, who gave me the heads up. Um, never will. So I got a heads up and I went live on YouTube. After speaking to Jack, to be honest, Jack said get ahead of it. I rang Jack, he said get ahead of it. I got on YouTube live and I told my story. And to be honest, I had nothing but positive feedback and I still do to this day. Um, as I said, I've never proud of anything I've done, but at the time I felt like I needed to make it, I needed to make money. And then once you realise when you've done four and a half years, having £20 a week to spend on your canteen and being hungry and cold and hot and whatever else happens and fighting and stuff, you realise it's just not to be all and end all. But when you're 17, 18, 19, it is to be all and end all. So yeah, the person who, just, who opened, put me out on Facebook and, in not Facebook, sorry, put me out on YouTube, he actually done me a massive favour, whether he meant to or not at the time, I don't know, but uh, it did do me a favour, so yeah. So at least now, like you say, you, you, you can actively move past that and you, you, you've never hidden from it and stuff like that, but touch on the YouTube side of things, do you think it's, like, you, the way I feel is, I always feel like I have to justify something because I'm online and I'm on YouTube. Do you think that's like a creator's fault? Do you think that's an audience fault? Do you think that's all the yeah. content creator's fault? Or do you I, think I it's a this, mixture of sort I of said everything? I said recently in one of my videos that I feel like when you put yourself out to the public, you sort of feel like you're old people something. So I had a problem with the lake and I've done a live vote that I won't really talk about unless Jack, Jack asked me. But I was disappointed that I felt like I let people down because I took people on a journey because I put it out there for the world and then I feel like when once um, yeah I feel once you put yourself out to the world you feel like you, you have to keep people on that journey does that make sense yeah. what I'm trying to say like you, you sort of give a piece of yourself but then you've got to give more because you've invited people to join this journey with you so then you can't decide to back out of it got to keep going and that's how I feel anyway personally so because going through that journey myself obviously with obviously the whole Karashi Roy saga and stuff like that I, I still firmly stand behind that everything I did 
within that challenge was well within the remix and stuff like that. And I still get people to this day that weren't even involved in the challenge asking questions like, oh, was there a problem with the fish? Was it bacterial? Was it this? Was it that? Like, no, it wasn't. Why did you bring the fish back to the farm? And this is from people that weren't even involved. So that side of things for me, I mean, I imported over 35,000 cores last year with a batch of 40. Yeah. Well, it weren't even a batch of 40. Maybe six out of the 40 yeah. didn't necessarily do so well, but we massively went I above and beyond to justify it. I had back to you if you yeah. recall them. I did bring them back, but I never had a problem. I still haven't got a bacterial problem to this day. So but all I, I can say from my experience was I've never did, I never had bacteria from them fish. That's all I And there's say. still fish in circulation. Yeah. Le Les Wheatcroft, Colville yeah. Decorating Services, people that are all actively down the farm, still continuously buying fish. Um, Matt Bailey, he was down here the other day picking up some more fish and stuff. He still, he hasn't got a problem either. Yes. Um, but just with that little bit of sort of because of something went a little bit wrong, the, the amount of pressure that I felt was unreal. So I can't actually imagine what that pressure would have felt like for you with somebody airing something like that, with it being in I the grand scheme of things, a, a fish dying like versus what you went through. Yeah, I feel like I always had piece. a plan. I always knew I was going to tell everyone about me past um, and I said I just wanted to do it on my terms I just wanted to do it when I felt like I got to a point where people knew me for me like me or hate me I don't, I don't care but you knew who I was you know what I mean I'm a loud mouth scout so they always have been they always will be agreed but you either like that or you don't like that but that's fine but that's what I wanted to do I wanted to be able to to just say it on my terms and I feel like I didn't really get the chance but on the positive, I did get it off my chest, I did manage to wear it, and I got so much positive feedback. I think I have one negative comment, I, um, someone said my brother was on drugs, and, and you know, my heart goes out to anyone whose family's experienced that. My uncle was on drugs, I grew up with my uncle being a heroin addict. I was around in my whole life, um, horrible thing, but I can't apologise for every single person who took drugs, and I can't apologise for every single person who sold drugs, all I can say is I apologise for what I've done. Um, and as I said, I'm four and a half years in prison for it. I rehabilitated myself and I did rehabilitate myself. I went to college, I done multiple college courses, I went back, I done maths, I done English. Um, you know, I done loads of stuff to rehabilitate myself. The prison allowed me to do so, but they didn't do it for me. So I made that choice to do so. Um, and I've got to say, 99% of the feedback was really positive, and I appreciate everyone who was, was positive towards me. That's yeah, amazing to see. So. Going back to the YouTube, why, why was it? Why did you pick YouTube? Like when you sort of started getting into Koi, is, is YouTube a tool that you used I in the past? I feel like he already knows the answer to this. So I found Jack on YouTube originally, um, <laughs> and I approached you at almost the twelve months of the day. Show almost last twelve months of the day. Yeah, and I was with so with Becky and with Mikey, and Mikey was five months old. Yeah, he's seventeen, ten, and eighteen months now. Um, You're not one of them parents, are you? That still judges the child's age. Yeah, yeah. Mom. So he's one and a half. It's the tenth of every yeah. the tenth of so every month. He's one month. and a half for anybody else that's yeah. wondering out there. Yeah, so he's seventeen, nearly eighteen months. On the tenth of the next month, he's eighteen months. Um, yeah, so so I, I, I started watching Jack's videos. I really liked them. Learned a lot. Learned what I was doing wrong. Bigger pond, all that. Went to the Coventry show again because of Jack's video. Said he's going, so I followed. You know, went there because of Jack. Um, and went over and Becky was like, you, you're not walking over to him. I said, I'm going over to him now. And she was like, oh my God, I want the grant to swallow me up, you're so cringe. And I said, I'm just going over. And I went over and they introduced myself and him and April were there and um, just dead nice, lovely people and took pictures with Mikey, yeah, remember? literally, straight um, away. Bet passed me Mikey, but there you go, there's the baby. Yeah, go, so, oh, so there's pictures with Mikey, five months old, with um, Jack and April and stuff. And, Got some fish, a fish, you remember? I got a little shower and a little yeah. sankey. Yeah. Uh, no, a little beckle it was, a little beckle. Just a little shower and a little beckle. Um, I had the show last year from Jack. Still doing um, good? I've got the beckle. Um, I didn't have the shower, I haven't looked at it anymore. <laughs> um, you live and learn. I learned a lot in this year. There's a lot that I wanted to mention this. So, there's, it's not a theory, it's a fact. Now, if you spend 18 minutes a day doing something for 12 months, you're better than 95% of the people in the world who do that. Yep. Now, I spend a lot more than 18 minutes a day doing coins. From 7 in the morning to 11 at night, most nights. So, 
I'm not I think people I'm underestimate how much it actually takes though. Oh look, I've got mud all over my legs right now from just sorting out fish before they come in. So now it's three minutes to six. And I'll still be in the pond at 11 o'clock tonight. Yep. Like, that, that's just how it is. Um, so yeah, so I'm not going to claim an expert, I never will, but I feel like I give that much time to koi. Listening, reading, watching, doing. I think doing is definitely the way to do it for me personally. It's the same with anything though, isn't it? Like, getting that hands-on experience with a pond and stuff and it doesn't matter how much you learn you can you can read and read and read and read and read but unless you're applying the knowledge that you've been reading the books and stuff like that because unfortunately there's no real sort of quiz school if you like that you can go to so no. reading the books and then and then getting involved and developing your knowledge further doing it's a massive massive part of it yeah. i think um, the, the whole youtube thing it, it's amazing in some ways and it's horrible in other ways. It, like, certain people make you feel good, certain people make you feel bad, the decisions you make make you feel good and bad, and you're putting it out for the world to see. So that if I say this week I've just bought 10 new fish, and then next week someone goes, where's them two, 10 new fish, Danny? You go, oh, I've had a problem. You've got to put that out there, and it's easy to someone to sit behind the camera and go, oh, sit on the, behind the computer and go, no, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. The reality is when you've got hundreds and hundreds of fish, thousands, tens of thousands, it's another world. It, it's not the same as having eight fish in your pond that you've had for ten years. Trust me, it's really not. For example, I mean, the, the tank here, the laptop sat in front of now, there's over 600 jumbo toes on in there. Yeah. In a three and a half thousand gallon pond. Roll back three years, if somebody told me, could you keep? 800 fish in a three and a half thousand gallon pond. My answer would have been absolutely not. Are you absolutely mental? But I'm, learning I'm, the craft honest, of water. I still wouldn't do that because my knowledge isn't there to do that. Uh, and that, that's me being totally honest, you know what I mean? I I haven't got the knowledge to keep 600 fish in that size pond. I hope we get to that point, but right now I haven't. So I would do what was, I'd probably have half of that because that, that's for my capabilities, you know what I mean? And, and you, you learn, don't you? That's the whole. You do pick up, and again, it goes back to the whole book side of things and the learning. For me, I'm very fortunate that I've got Yoss Abbott and, and Merv Westgate behind me and Ernie Strisson and Ashley Darth and stuff like that. And I think with me, that's what a lot of people fail to realise is that I am the face of Yoshiki going in England. Yeah. I have got a whole team of people behind the back of me. Like, prime example, with the Karashi Goy Challenge and that, a lot of people were like, well, have you spoke to Paula directly? Like, Yes, I have. Paul has wrote our whole biosecurity program for the farm. And did I take the lead on the whole Karashigo thing with Dr. Paula Reynolds? No. And it might sound very arrogant, but I literally have a team behind the back of me that do that for me. Do you know what I mean? Like I've got Ashley Dart as the UK rep and manager that does all that sort of things for me. And that's what I want to pass on to people like yourself now, becoming a registered dealer and stuff like that. Now you've got your, um, your pet store license and stuff. Uh, and the same for a couple of other channels, which I'm not going to shout out because I don't know whether they'd want me to or not. Um, but being able to lean on Yossi's knowledge and Merv's knowledge and Ashley Dark's knowledge, whether that's you, you, you're taking your shiki goi from us or Japanese fish from us and stuff like that. Because one thing I will say is with you doing multiple different sources for multiple different farms, your, your import criteria, as you know, is a hell of a lot different for your shiki goi fish than what it is for Japanese fish. Yeah. And depending on what Japanese farm you've had it from, depends on what your sort of settling in criteria needs to be, what your treatment regimes are, what, what kind of things you need to look out for when them fish are sort of first starting to come into the country, which obviously we will touch base on that on a later podcast in the future when Danny's starting to import from different farms over in Japan. That, okay, well, why do you have to change your import regime? Why do you have to change your quarantine regime for different farms and different places? How are you mixing your fish together and all that kind of stuff? to be able to bring out any of your viruses it's, um, it's something that I've learned the hard way. I, I will not cross contaminate now, at least for six weeks. I'm um, being so strict with myself on that. The polytunnel that I've just set up, you might see it on some of my videos, is, um, is literally your shiki koi. There's nothing else in that polytunnel but your shiki koi. The nets in there are for them fish, the filters are for them fish, and nothing crosses. Um, and it, it's a hard learning curve because you go, oh, well, I've, I've just moved that fish up over there, then I, I create that bass and stuff like that, and, and you'd have to get to a point where, and I have got to that point, but it did take me a while, I'll be totally honest, because the easier option, definitely not the easier option 
when you when you're de dealing with a problem afterwards. Um, so now my biosecurity has got like a mentor and probably probably too much in some sense that I send myself a little bit crazy with it. You mean you can't ever really be too much on it though? Because I mean you think inside this polytunnel now there's two there's four ponds. There's two five and a half thousand gallon ponds, there's two three and a half thousand gallon ponds in front of us. When an import arrives, if I'm bringing in a segment of fish, say in pond one, which is the, which is the, the one on the right hand side of us now, pond two being the one that's on the left. If I'm putting fish into pond one, even though it's still come from Yushiki group, I will still class that as its own farm shipment. Yeah. Just so going into the future, if anything changes and expands, and we start doing both, or we start, I don't know, a, a new developing country starts producing some of the best coal you've ever seen. And you think, you know what, that's an avenue that we want to look at as well. And I'm not saying that I'm going to, but if I can put the right level of steps in place now for the correct levels of biosecurity, because, I mean, we've had imports in the past before where we've, we've had an import in and the import hasn't shipped well. The ammonia's been so high in the bags that the fish are all stripping fins, they're, they're, they're stripping pectorals and stuff like that that don't look the best. Yeah. I've made a judgment call as a farm owner in England to say, OK, we're going to pull that import. Now, some people might look at that and go, why? You've paid all that money for those fish because it's really not worth me taking that shipment in to potentially throw thousands of pounds worth of products at it for it to still, still go belly up. And what it also does... Products aren't cheap. No, it, it's really not. It's really not. I mean, there's certain... We were talking about it a moment ago. There's certain products I won't use again. For example, I, I will no longer use Alperex again. I've treated Alperex in this pond here, and I've treated Alperex in another pond. The other pond hasn't took the Alperex so well on the bigger fish. Um, the dosage was absolutely bang on, the pH was bang on, KH, GH was. But it's only through my external research after that that I, that I then very quickly realised how much of an invasive treatment Alperex actually is. Um, so I won't actually use Alperex, I'll go back to my ROKF treatment I was using before and just to quickly touch on that, the ROKF treatment is something that I put together myself. A lot of people are saying, oh, well, tell us what you put in it, tell us what you're mixing together. I won't do that because I know what I can get away with on, on a farm level compared to what you guys can at home. And that's the last thing I want to do is A, give away all the trade secrets, but B, give away what works for me and doesn't necessarily work for you. I mean, there's other um, wholesale uh, importers out there that have discussed in the past before about different ways that Japanese people treat their fish and, and it, it blows your mind the kind of treatment levels that they do. I pick up my treatment regimes from the farm in Poland, so it, it works for me. But well, Albrecht is something I definitely sort of uh, never use again. So talking on disasters then, what's the biggest disaster you've had so far as not so much as a coin dealer, because I know you've not had one yet, no. and by the way, you will have one. No, it's, just, no, it's not no, a matter no of doubt. when so it's... It, the biggest one was when I used the silicone. Um, I lost the 25 fish I used. I had a pressure filter running as a, 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 um, a pre-filter for me easy pod, because it was quite heavily stocked. It was in winter. The water was heated to 22 degrees, if I remember right, in the video on it. Um, I broke the hose tail that comes out of the pressure filter. So I switched it off, I got some standard silicone out of Wix or whatever it was, put it on, an hour later it felt dry to the touch, obviously it wasn't, put it on, um, turn the filter back on the next day, come down 25 fish were floating, about 10 fish left alive. Wow, and, I remember that. And people were saying, no way it was a silicone, I tested the water parameters, I'd never had a fish gone after that, all the fish that survived never had red, um, Red gills, no, there was not, there was nothing, there was no marks, there was no lumps, there was no bumps, and some of them are still, but well, most of them are still going now. Um, I have got rid of a couple, gave them a couple away. Um, so yeah, I, and honestly, if there was another reason, I'd come out and tell you. I genuinely would. I believe to this day, I use cheap, nasty silicone that you'd use to silicone your windows, and I lost 25 fish because I didn't let it set, and it should, I should have used something like CT1 or. Wow, MS300, MS shameless yeah. plug for call at CWD, MS300, so yeah, shameless plug for call at CWD, uh, hopefully we'll have call on the uh, podcast very, very soon, um, nice. so talking about then, obviously products and stuff like that, so Koi Dealer, YouTuber to Koi Dealer, where did the transition sort of begin? So, the one thing I did, I've never really spoke about, I've always wanted a farm since I was a kid, 
I'm animal obsessed, I always have been. Um, but I think the reality is there's no money in farming, and I, I think most people know that. So You say that? Have you seen my farmer here hanging out the side of his £100,000 tractor? Yeah, but I feel like he's in a decent position, he's got a lot of stuff going on here, which this is true. I don't think most people have. I think like when, you, when you're watching these farm videos, and even Clarkson's farm, anyone who's, who's seen that. Epic. And they're, they're making pennies, you know what I mean? And so, anyway, I've always wanted to farm, I've always wanted to land, I've always never wanted neighbours, which luckily right now I've got no neighbours, it's amazing. Um, I, I like to be a bit anti-social. I like to switch off my social side, you know what I mean? So, um, it, it was never really an option, like, you know, where do you get a million pounds to buy a farm and then keep cows? It's just not realistic. So, the koi just gave me that in, to be honest. I really enjoyed the fish. I, I love learning about it. Um, and it's just become a realistic, like, I, if I put a lot of time and effort and money at this, I, I can hopefully make a, a living out of it. So, um, yeah, I think that that was just it. Just sort of clicked in me in my head. I love it. I love it. I wouldn't spend till eleven o'clock every night looking after fish and being around fish if it didn't. <laughs> yeah, there is that bit. There is well. that. So you've got to love it. You can't just go. I'm going to make money out of fish because I think the reality is you're not going to do that. I mean, it's a long, long goal. I've spent a year now not in a penny out of fish and still now not in, in money. But with a, with a goal, and eventually I will, which is hopefully soon. Um, I'm, I'm in a position, luckily I've got another business that pays me wages, so it means that I don't have to do too much work on that, but I still <coughs> get to, to work on this, um, which is fantastic for now, but obviously that can't last forever, so eventually I do need to make money out of Koi. And yeah, I think I really enjoy it. I think that's the main, the hot heart of it. I've always wanted a business, I've always wanted to do something, but I've never totally enjoyed anything. So you're fortunate with the land space that you've got at your place at the moment about an acre. to be able to set up as a koi dealer at home. Yeah. Now I know there's other people that will be watching this that may have always wanted to have sort of got into the world of sort of that they've been a koi enthusiast or a koi hobbyist for, for many, many years. How hard was it to actually transfer the knowledge in your head to paper to be able to get your pet store license at home um, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people realize you can actually trade as a pet so store one, one thing i will say is, is I, I have had a lot of businesses over the years so i have got some knowledge i'm not saying i'm an expert and i'm not saying i'm a businessman by it by far from me imagine definitely not but i have got some knowledge of how to make money um, so I definitely feel like just going, I'm going to sell fish and you don't know where to start selling them. I think I, I definitely wouldn't advise doing that because as soon as you register that company, then you've got taxes and stuff to, start to think about. So yep. making a limited company shouldn't be your first thought. You can actually say for three months before making a limited company for anyone who didn't know that. So that could be a, a, an option to give someone a three month um, and that's if they wanted to go down the route of being a limited company. They can always trade yeah, as a sole trader. There, which I wouldn't recommend because your tax is a lot less on limited companies. You only pay 20% tax, which is another podcast, to be honest. But, um, yep. But, yeah, so, yeah, I definitely recommend if you've got a passion for it and you've got a way to sell, I think like having a way to sell, which in my case will be YouTube. I've got UK, I run UK Koi Owners. I'm an admin for that, 28,000 members. Um shameless plug with the coach great cards. Card. So it, UK Koi Owners is a free group and it's really, really good. I, again, I gave a lot of hours to that day. I've learned so much from it because I get to read every post, answer in my own head, then go in the comments and see what everyone else has said and then I know whether I'm right or wrong. So I have, I have actually learned so much from doing that. Um, but yeah, I, I say the Koi dealer thing, I think if, if, you, if that's what you want to do, you've got to be sure you're doing it because the hours involved, I don't think you could do it as a a safety job. Absolutely not. It's just, Absolutely just too not. much time involved in keeping them alive and keeping them healthy. If and you leave livestock alone, you've got dead stock. Yeah. Literally. I mean, I, I cannot count the amount of times, because I've lost count, that I've been at home midnight and I've thought, I wonder if those fish are okay that I've just treated. And I'll come straight back up. I wonder if, you know, leave the hose on. Is it off? Is it connected? Did I fill the generator up? Why have my cameras gone offline? It's it's ludicrous. I mean, I live 0.8 miles away from the farm, so I can literally get here in two and a half minutes. Like, it's really not a lot at all. But I think a lot of people underestimate the sheer volume of exactly what it takes to run their own pond at home, 
let alone me here that's got the best pot of 13 ponds at the moment, very densely stocked, and yourself that's got seven, seven that's, yeah. that's gearing up to be able to open. I mean, when, when, is, when are you officially open? Is it appointment um, only? Is it so, online only? Is it yeah, in so, person? Yeah, so a lot will be online. Uh, I am planning on to doing shows next year. There will be appointments only as well. At the end of the day, I lived there, you know, my family lived there, so I don't want random people just turning up day and night, um, which is something I do worry about a little bit, to be honest, we live, do live in the sticks, there's not, uh, there's no one, no one coming if you start screaming, no one's going to hear you, <laughs> so um, that, that is a bit of a worry really, having random people just turning up there, but yeah, I, I think, I think as I said, like luckily for me, my, my goal, my big plan is not really that I need to win loads of money right now, I don't really, so it's more of a building building it slow and hopefully get it right that's sort of what, what I'm going for um, yeah I, I think like other people are going to be in different positions where the day they open they need to earn X amount of thousands and stuff and luckily for me I don't need to do that so that's given me the opportunity to do it slower and get it right and I feel like I, I, I've got my license in, in now so I can say that as of today I still reason I still haven't is because I want it looking right I want it to be right and I, I yeah, I just want to, I, I want to sit right, it's, it's, it's a sit right with me. Obviously that, I can always find a floor and I can always drag it out for another week and another week, which I'm not going to do that. So sometime in the next month we are going to officially start saving. Um, right now I'm getting products on the website and get it at, like, courier company, I have to sort that and stuff like that. So I just want all that stuff in place before I start selling fish, to be honest. How hard is it to take pictures of fish? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, Learning how to take pictures of fish, to be honest, yeah. is... Credits to Chris Marsh and his team at Quinny Coy, because how them guys do it is beyond me. Every single one of those fish is picture perfect every single time. Perfect pectoral positions, the lot. It takes so much work to be able to photograph fish. Especially small fish. Yeah. Small fish are a nightmare, because you're trying to get right in on them. Um, it's something I've been practicing at, to be honest. Um, I've got a little Instagram which I haven't put much on but I put three pictures on there and the pictures are really nice but to be honest there was probably 50 pictures of each fish took yeah. to get them three really nice pictures to put on the Instagram. That's my boy's guy on Instagram but as I say I haven't really used the page yet I will use it more as time goes by. But I think I'm enjoying it. I, I think the thing that I've never found as I said I've had countless businesses um, not all in my name as well, so it's not all on companies else, but I've been partners on different businesses and um, yeah, I feel like this is the first time I've actually enjoyed getting up at 7 o'clock in the morning and going and cleaning dirty water in the rain and the cold and the wet and moving fish in the snow and you know, putting paddling pools up in the snow, that, that alone was an experience. It's crazy, um, isn't it, the way much you watch the weather as a koi dealer slash koi farmer? Like, it's, it's absolutely insane. It's getting like, excited when it's thunder because I'm thinking I might get a spawn out of it. Yeah, so no, <laughs> absolutely um, right. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, weather, the weather takes over your life. It does. It's it does. hot, it's always great, we've got some lovely weather. It's too hot, air, air on, open the doors. It's it controls your life. I think the other day, we got, it was 28 degrees outside, it was 78 degrees inside the tunnel. Yeah, it was I was disgusting last week. Well, it, it was absolutely insane, but obviously like, for nice us. This is you know, this is, this is probably what, 20 odd degrees yeah. in here. It's really nice weather, but last week it was 55 when I was in yeah. here. It was deep. I, I couldn't be in here for more than five minutes, that's the long time to breathe. Literally, I mean, I've got my camera set up so I can see when people are coming in and out of the farm. So I'm literally inside the polytunnel with my top off, absolutely sweating buckets. And then when I see when, I, when the cameras trigger on my phone and I see somebody walking down the track or coming down the drive, I literally rip my t-shirt on very quickly so people don't walk in and see me. Literally boobs out the lot. Do you know what I mean? Nobody wants yeah, to see that. To be honest, I live in shorts, shorts and Crocs all day. No t-shirts, never. But I'm at home. So I today's the first time I've been in, in tracky bottoms in about six months. Yeah, it's a bit cool today. I get it, mate. Though. So when you open, you're doing Yashiki Go, you're doing Japanese. Yeah, I'll is be it, honest, and I've literally plan? said, I, I don't know if you've met these things, but I've said, there's a, there's a part of me, obviously everything I, I started was with strong copy and Jack, and I'll be totally honest, most of me know that, you know what I mean? <laughs> so obviously I, I found on YouTube, I said over YouTube, and a lot of it was with him saying to me, why don't you vlog at me? Um, why don't you try this, why don't you try that? So, so I have, you know what I mean? Um, but there's, there's a part of me that I don't want it to look like, a shit version of what Jack's doing. 
Yeah, and I'll be totally straight about that. Man, so there's parts of this farm now that still look shit, and it's been eight months. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. It's a mudbath out there, but it's getting there. Oh, every like every today, time you is. come, it is getting better, do you know what I mean? Which is good to see. And it's a big job. I, I've seen... I spent two days messing around with pumps and filters and UVs for the paddling pool just for one. Do you know what I mean? So when you look at these ponds, you might just go, oh, still mud out there, but it's hard work. Do you know what I mean? It's physically demanding work. Um, but yeah, it, it is a part that I don't want to look like a shit face and what Jack's doing. So I'll, I'll see I'm doing your cheeky going. I really like these cheeky going fish. I've got some lovely fish from your cheeky going. I think they're exceptional, mate. I think they're the best fish money can buy. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to be doing Japanese fish as well, but there is an end goal, and the end goal is to be British bred, totally British bred, and that's for biosecurity. So eventually, Jack only has the one farm coming here. Obviously, there's going to be there's other dealers who might have all different British, English bred, British bred, whatever. I'm in Wales, so now so I'm saying British bred rather than English bred. The Welsh well, don't like that. Um, I would say that's one thing we've not actually touched on is where you're actually based, which yeah, is so, uh, I mean, in um, the valleys. So it depends, uh, definitely not in the valleys, but it depends who you ask. So if you ask a scouser, I'm in Langollen, and if you ask a Welshman, I'm in Clangochlan. Um, yeah, and I've lived there. So it's it's a lovely place, right by the Horseshoe Pass. Lovely, lovely area, lovely people. Uh, Clangochlan for, for uh, Ian Endless and the rest of uh, What the a Welsh man, watches. by the way. What yeah, a he, man he, he, he is. is. Well, He's insane. You work hard, you know. You see the oh, farm, it's all set for Sunday. He found me on the Friday night live just after it finished. Like, I said, I'll oh, give me tinker after live. And I thought, oh, he'll be in bed now, being, being uh, an old sport and all that. But he literally found me up straight away. Got me pickaxe, mate, and I'll be down in the morning. I was like, mate, you're a godsend. He was like, see ya. Here before me. Literally, every Saturday he's here before me. Absolutely insane. That guy's level of commitment is, is wild. Obviously, we're all over his on Thursday night, aren't we? Five of his pond and that, so... That'll be a, a nice get together with the lads and stuff, and yeah, we might we might actually run a podcast then. I don't actually know because know. beers flowing. You, get a few, you yeah, know what yeah. it was like on the last import. I've had to literally mute all the original audio yeah, and just put voiceover tracks on because it was horrendous. Yeah, ended up being about eight of us there in the end. Twelve, twelve, 12 in total. That many, and it was just everyone was just swearing and whatever. So it got a bit hectic, didn't it? But it was good though. It, it, it was it was good to be a part of it. The so white. Legend. He is, he is, and he cooks up some good Jamaican food to be fair. Yeah. So what, what's your thoughts on an import? Is it as mad as you thought it'd be? Is it less hectic than you thought it'd be? Do um, you get the excitement? Not, not, I mean obviously I know what's coming out, the, the bags and boxes. I think, but what, what was I here for about four or five hours, yeah. delayed, the import was delayed. So obviously by the time we got here, there was panic mode kicking in, yeah. wasn't he? Like, it was, roasted, it was it was hours. so hot that day, we, we must have been in high twenties yeah. all day that day. And the fish had come, and to be fair, they were all great when they come off. But I think everyone had that worry and that we were going to open them bags and they were all going to be upside down, and they wasn't. And there was a odd one, the odd one, little tiddlers that, that hadn't made it, but out of what, what was it, five, six thousand? Uh, no, eight thousand in total. Eight thousand, and there was maybe, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to guess, but there was only a couple of small dead ones. Um, I'd say on the day around 40 or so. Yeah, We've well, maybe lost another 350 to 400, which to some people that might that might sound like a hell of a lot, but it's literally less than one percent of the import that come in. Uh, and considering what these bigger fish handle it a lot better, but smaller fish don't necessarily handle it as well with, with the heat. These were the smallest. There's 150. Being, what, 8 cm. Yeah, eight to 12 cm was the yeah, smallest. I, I think the, the 8 cm were the ones who struggled the most in that way. It was just too hot. It was it was unbelievable. He's what can you do? They're, they're fishing on the way. They're on the way. There's nothing. We've got to get here and get them in the water. And to be fair, everyone jumped all hands on deck, yeah. and we got them back. Got them out of the bags, into bowls, out of the bowls, into the water in rapid time. We didn't stop. Um, so no, that was good as well. It was an experience. I, I love that. I love I love being a part of stuff that. You know, most people just don't get to be a part of really um, obviously Jack's doing all the time, a lot of the koi dealers are doing all the time, but to the average koi keeper. It's daunting at first though, like when I first started importing them that like I say I was very fortunate that I, I literally had Josk on standby and I was able to pick up the phone and go, mate, what do I do about this? Mate, what do I do about this? Because it's different importing like when you import through Warner fish <coughs> excuse me, on the Japanese side of things, it's very different because you're doing 
20, 30 boxes. I'm doing 250 to 400 boxes at a time. I mean, the last import, I was very fortunate, there was only 60 boxes that came in. I say, I say only. That was a, uh, a man chain of what five of us, literally yeah. bag, 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 cut the bag, get, get them in the bowl, scoop them out the bowl, get them into the water. And it, it took us hours, didn't it? Yeah. About and four they say hours. it's only 60, there was what? There might have been 12 people, there's probably six or eight of us who were actually hands on, doing yeah. a couple of just standing around watching. Eating. Eating, yeah. Um, and, but the, the ones who were working didn't stop working. Not, not for a second, do you know what I mean? And it, it, it took time. It, it, like, if you were on your own doing that, I'd be a lot more fish with the bad. But re realistically, oh, yeah. by the time you would have got them off the van going that way, it would have been another three, four hours put on to yeah. that time, definitely. It would have been absolutely hectic. And yeah, it's physical as well, them bags yeah. aren't light, are they? No. You know what I mean? 15 kilos of water, uh, uh, and then uh, some of the fish have got 250 in the bag yeah. on the uh, 8 to 12. So, like I say, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of fish that, that, are, that are coming through the door. And the majority of them on this occasion were the smaller ones. So, but they're, 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 they've handled well now. And like I say, we've lost probably another 350 to 400. So, like I say, a lot of people might be thinking, like, wow, that's a lot. But out of that 350 to 400, I'd probably say 2 to 250 was the whole lot sort of give them a chance kind of vibe, do you know what I mean? Like I knew they were she struggling was often, really yeah. bad with lack of oxygen and stuff like that. So I, I'm not surprised that we've lost that sort of volume, but it's well underneath the averages of what I would have expected on that level of import, because it's... Honestly, as I say, every, everyone was gut wrenched because I think we would expect them to just be bad to their fish. The heat, it was the heat alone, yeah. the heat was just this, this was what, at that point, eight o'clock. Yeah. And it was still in the height or mid to mid twenties. Well they arrived so at twenty past eight, didn't they? Twenty yeah. past eight. It was about twenty two, twenty three degrees at night. Yeah, and bear in mind they've been travelling through that from Poland right across. So they were probably getting thirty degrees through through some of that that some of that day in that van. Um, so I think we done quite pretty well to be fair. <laughs> but no, it was a good experience. I enjoyed it. Everyone had a laugh. The the, the audio on them videos would have been good to listen to. Oh, scrape the though. I literally, probably channel banned, it was that bad. And the grief that you took was absolutely unreal. Yeah. I thought it was hilarious. In the white, like a bit of banter. But no, that's what yeah. it's all about. So when, you, um, so when you're opening that, you're going to have a mixture of Japanese and Mishiki Go? Yeah, so, so that's the plan. As I say, that the thing about me being standalone and me being conscious about being standalone. And also, I want to be British bred, so my end goal is that, obviously, as I'm going through these fish and I'm buying in, 50 fish, 100 fish, couple of 100 fish, I'll be hand selecting ones and twos to take out to grow on, to grow on, which will all become my future brood stock. Um, from, so then I'll be crossing Yoshihikoi, different farms in Japan. Um, so I've got a couple of, I've got a batch of um, Dainichi at the minute. And there's two they that, really good, by the way. There's two that stand out, massively stand out for me, so they're, they're never getting sold. And, um, It'd be the same, so I asked you about the big shows, so, so my intention is to try and, try and do a DOG on like 10 of the big shows or something like that, so they're like 50 odd CM. Um, and again, I might only end up with, with one or two of them that, that get kept, but this will all go working towards next year, the year after and so on, of me having good quality, top quality brew stuff, that's my plan. That's what it's all about, because the, the beauty with Obviously myself doing the Ishiki but I know what the bloodlines is and I know what's inside of the bloodlines. So like I, I seen a YouTuber made a comment the other day about, oh, do you know the bloodlines that's in, in those fish to another dealer? And it was like, well, you only know what that farm is telling you. Yeah. Or you only know what that importer is telling you. But for me, I physically see the brood stocks. I physically helped breed 12 different varieties of koi over at the Ishiki Go last year. So I can literally picture the brood stock, which is why Yossi's new line of Achiever that's in here, I'm so excited about that because I know what they're going to turn into. They don't look much now, but because I've seen what the parent, the parent lineage is, I, for one, am more than happy to sit on a lot of the smaller ones, get them to sort of 45 to 50 cm, and they're going to be absolutely special, special fish. And, and that's why, obviously, we're running the big sale at the moment, but sort of called crazy, 40% off, because we want to be able to get the quality on the cover so I can go back to having the likes of the Kui Academy for those sort of development fish and it helps out the likes of yourself then as well and my other dealers moving forward but when yeah. they do want brood stock or they want something that is that little bit more extra special that's been grown on that they can literally see coming from a sort of 10 to 12 cm and, and, and put on sort of 30 
support you see Emma in the first sort of 12 months that we've been here at the farm is, is absolutely incredible. I mean, you were here when uh, one of the auction fish that I've been growing on, the Hyatt Suri. I took that from 20 to 52 cm yeah. inside of seven months. You do know this, this is going to have to go out on Friday now, don't you? On the first one, because you've just been talking about your um, Yes, this is, very true. this is very so true. So if this goes out in four weeks' time, yeah. you've, you've mixed the balls. So, so there you go, this is the first one. So if anybody is listening, <laughs> whether you're driving to work or not, uh, we have got the cool crazy sale going on at the moment. Obviously, as you guys know, this place is funded by cool dealers like Danny coming down, buying our stock, uh, you guys coming down as, as, as sort of Joe Public and as subscribers to the channel and supporting it. Every spare penny that I make as a business gets reinvested straight back in. I'd love to sit here and say, oh yeah, I'll take a wage and I'm earning a fortune. I'm really, really not. Um, it, it, it's hand to mouth. I, I think, think really, people really don't realise, like, just every day I'm spending money. Um, what does I buy today? I've, I've eaten mugs, so I bought mugs today. I spent 150 quid that on mugs. That reminds me, I need to order mugs at the show. Yeah, so I spent 150 quid on mugs. Yesterday I spent 40 pounds on the floor of mine. See, the day before I spent 300 pounds on paddling pools and pumps. I, it's non-stop. And I, I, that, that might sound, not sound like a lot of money to some people. might sound like a lot of money a lot of money to other people, but it doesn't stop. You're constantly buying. And then you go, I haven't got that pipe connector. It's 30 quid. I need another air uh, pump, it's another hundred not quid. So how do you think I feel? What people keep asking me, oh, how much are you in for the farm? How much are you in for the farm? You at the minute. Clue what you're into the farm, and I keep you? I keep <laughs> saying to people, oh, it's about 120 to 130 grand. I was with my accountant, and that's not me bragging by the way, so please do not think that. It's just that's just how well we've done off the back of the love and support of you guys. Obviously I've invested in every piece of saving that I've got in the bank and stuff like that, and almost put us on the bread line. Um, it's got that hand to mouth at times. I was with my accountant the other day and he went, I did the updated figures and it's now closer to the 200k mark that we're at. I can believe it. I, like, I, I, I can believe it and I, pr I probably wouldn't have believed it if I wouldn't have been trying to do it and realising that you can't even buy a piece of pipe. I, I bought a, a four valve to pour it into a 110mm reducer. Yeah. Now you can get these really cheap, really thin ones, but I bought one of the thicker ones a bit better. It cost me £9.99 plus £4.50 postage. So it cost me 15 quid for a reducer for one piece of pipe or one ball valve. And again, it, it might not sound a lot, but it's just like £15 for that little tiny piece of plastic. It, you, you just don't realise, and they just add up, and then you need a rubber boot, and we're going to rubber boot now. And the 12 quid, you need a big one, and the 25 quid, and it's just, it doesn't stop. Well, I think that's what I sort of, sort of took from the coy dealer thing is the amount, when you go to these places and they look amazing, like the ball's going to look great, but obviously the whole site, you're talking there's another underground Easy. to get Easy. this place looking like a, like a picturesque place, you know what I mean? So you, when you go to these places and they look amazing, you just think how much time, effort and money have you spent to get into this and that's what my goal is, that's what I wanted to go to. I don't just want it to be a working farm, I want it to really look nice. Some of the biggest working farms in the UK, in a nice way, don't look very clean. Um, and that's something that I want to make sure that, that mine is. I want to make sure mine looks good, nice to the eye and the fish are to a good quality. I think they both go hand in hand. I mean, you're looking like... Why do you think I'm so desperate to cover that tunnel at the minute? Yeah. I mean, A, for future proofing and, and security, but B, it will transform the whole look of the farm. Oh, definitely, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just, getting, just getting the roads the road finished, the tracks yeah. finished, but I can imagine that's probably thousands and thousands to, yeah. to get that, that level properly. It's like the, the, uh, the tarmac strip that we've got between the QT house yeah. and the Koi Academy. Just putting a, a run of uh, AstroTurf down there, you're probably talking a region of about 1,200 quid. But that 1,200 quid makes all the difference, do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So when we do these big crazy sales and that, we obviously we have to keep X amount in the pot to be able to go out and rebuy more, more fish and restock more fish and stuff like that. But the profit, it's not like I'm driving around in a frigging Range Rover, no. do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm really, really not. It, it, that profit would literally go on something like that. I mean, the, the goal at the minute is to try and raise uh, off the sale £5,000 um, cleared profit so we can actually go ahead and, and pay a company to, to cover the poly tunnel because I very quickly realised there are some jobs I can absolutely 100% do to the best of my ability and it'll be absolutely fine. 
but there is other jobs that I will do 110% that will look like I put 4% effort in. Yeah, and I've that, just I very think... quickly realised that sometimes doing it myself costs me quadruple the amount. Yeah. So, I don't know, was I here for part two of covering this? Yes. Was I? So I was yeah, here part for part one, one and part two, and it cost double. Yeah. Just because of a mistake that out of the 12, 15 people that were here, no one picked up on. Not one person said, this, this up blow away if, if that's not sorted. Yeah. Because none of us knew, and yeah, it blew away. Um, funny, when I look at it now, not so funny oh, in I, the I start think I of cried. December. If that would have been mine, I would have drove up that day, I think I would have died. Yeah. I was wounded. On. Mick, yeah. the farmer, phoned me up, he went, mate, you're not going to believe it, but your follow tunnel's blown off. And I went, yeah, yeah, of course it has. He went, mate, he said, I'll help you take it back down, it's blown off. And at that point, I knew he was being serious. Yeah and literally my heart just sang because I was going through the rigmarole of the Karachi Road Challenge yeah. then the tunnel had blown off I'd just gone through like the massive amount of hate campaign that I'd had um, off people on email and stuff like that of which I'll touch about that on a, on a later podcast but some of the stuff and the people think and say and do it just, it, it'll blow your mind um, but like I say that's for a different podcast in the future um, but yeah, I was going through all that and then to come up and literally see the polytunnel half in the cow field, half still attached, it was just soul destroying. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it really, really was soul destroying. Can I mind? As I said, like, I, I, people know that I ripped the back out of that messing around after the event, but after the point, knowing that it was all recovered then and it was sort yeah. of okay. But yeah, like, I, like I wouldn't even want to imagine how devastating it would be, to be honest. But, um, I said I did give a lot of stick out afterwards, but that was once I knew it. it though, that was once I knew it was all settled, though, yeah. and everyone was okay. And like you know, you got this recovered, so it wasn't as much of a big deal anymore. Um, but no, it, it was it was devastating to hear at the time. I think you put up a short, didn't you? Yeah, put up a short, and then uh, a piss taking YouTube channel called Coy World News decided yeah. to uh, take the mic out of it, blowing off into another field, which uh, which at the time was quite funny. But again, when you when you look at what that channel was and what that channel was about, it, it just, at first it was funny, but then they, they overstepped the mark because they were doing a few different channels and then it just become like a, a one-centered sort of hate campaign. Yeah. I mean, I'm 99.9% .9 sure who is behind the back of that. And when I do find out who it is, the lawsuit that's coming their way is absolutely unreal. And I mean unreal. I, I get it because like, there was a point when I was at a really low point when I was getting back to like when I, when I first went to jail. We had the um, Liverpool Echo ran a big story and they made us sound like, you know, cases were and had nothing on us. The way they were talking, it sounded like we were the biggest in the world. And and we wasn't, like, we, were, we were, you know, we made money and stuff, but we, we were chances, I'll be totally honest. Um, and there was people just online and they absolutely slaughtered us. Now, whether right or wrong, you know, we sold drugs and, and whatever, but we were never violent, we were never horrible, we never done anything to hurt anyone. We were just money makers, we wasn't gangsters, we never claimed to be, but we got absolutely annihilated. We were called bullies, we were called bully victims, we were, we were called absolutely everything. And, and it's hard, it's hard when everyone's going at you at once. I think that's yeah. the point of what I'm trying to say. It's like, it, it, it is tough, especially, you know, especially yeah. when I'm just a guy that, that started doing coal. I went from a YouTuber to a coal dealer like yourself and then went from a coal dealer to a coal farmer. Yeah. And it was absolutely real. And, and to be fair, like, I mean, to be, I might actually use the podcast to name and shame some of the people that have said some of the stuff online because I've got to the point now where I've realized that I don't have to justify anything anymore. I'm not going to say journey. the name because it's not my place to, but there's a person you told me about last week that you give a lot of stuff to for free and then that, that turned on you and I thought that was unbelievably disgusting to be honest because yeah I, I, was, I was shocked by it to be honest but um, well, it's one of them. what can you do, you be nice to someone and then I know, always like, say to people, judge me as you find me, yeah. not as what other people tell you about me because some people that I've, I've sort of crossed paths with and stuff like that it's the same friends with, with when you say about the haven't. Gastro Challenge, it's like what you're saying about that, so I defended you on someone's video and then I had people go, don't you work for them, I've never worked for anyone in my life, I'm 30 years old and I had one job when I was 16, I've been self-employed ever since, so just get that straight for anyone who says, um, 
But no, I don't work for Jack. I, I've got no affiliation with Jack apart from I buy fish from him now. Before that, I bought fish from him. Um, That's it, nothing, nothing's nothing changed. Nothing's really changed, to be honest. And we get on really well with mates. You know, I come down, I talk to him. I don't always video when I'm down here, because I just come down, whatever. But, um, th yeah, I forgot the point. Just on about like the like the hate campaigns, the, the amount of oh, abuse yeah, so, you get as so a YouTuber and stuff. So I say I defended them on, on a video, and someone said, "Don't you work for Jack and stuff like that?" And so I don't need to be, don't need to work for someone to defend him if it was wrong. I wasn't defending Jack per se. I was saying I had three of them trashy boys, and I haven't got a bacteria problem, and I've never had a bacteria problem. Um, and you can watch me here journey on YouTube to prove that. Because if you have bacteria. There would have been a point where you couldn't see me fish on a weekly basis. You see me fish, so the thing is, though, we, we, with the whole lot bacteria gate, as I'll call it, what, what a lot of people don't realize is if you have a fish that is immune to a certain strain of bacteria, this is any cold deal, not just me as a farmer, but any cold deal, British bread, Polish bread, Israeli bread, Indonesian bread, like it, it does not matter. All we can do as coy farmers and coy dealers, by the letter of the law with CFAS, is when and the pet store agencies, when the when your coy are sold, they have to be in the healthiest condition possible for them. So scraping clean, no ulcers, no wounds, no bacteria and stuff like that. Now, if you've got a fish that's got a bacterial problem in your pond, in, uh, in your pond as a dealer, and you, and you take it out and you, you stuff it off in a quarantine area somewhere and you don't say anything, that is where I'll draw the line. And I was talking to this with somebody that's actually going to be on the podcast very soon. I was talking to this with them and they said that's like obviously where you've got to draw the line and that's where a lot of unscrupulous dealers shirk around the rules. If I've got a pond here and if I ever, I mean, touch wood, I haven't had a bacterial problem. But if I did, that whole pond would be off sale until literally we've, we've gone through everything we've got to Paula Reynolds, we've gone through everything with Ashley Dawes, we've gone through everything with Merv, we've gone through everything uh, with Yoss Abbott, just to make sure that those fish are not harbouring anything that they shouldn't be. We'd be introducing naive fish in there and stuff like that to make sure there definitely wasn't anything passing through. But if, if, I, if anybody imports something, and like you and your Japanese stuff, for example, let's say you heat ramp for your eight weeks, you go through, you do your parasite treatments and everything's fine, you as a dealer can't tell if that fish is holding a bacterial problem. No, no, no. Absolutely nobody can. And I will fully, fully stand behind the back of that. That every coin dealer in the country at some point in time has given somebody a bacterial problem unknowingly. unknowingly of course. And I'll state that again, unknowingly given somebody a bacterial problem. Because nobody can predict it. It is impossible. Now, don't get me wrong, if you go to a koi dealer's and you buy a koi that's got a clear sign of an ulcer and you still think, you know what, I'm taking that home and putting it in my pond, then more fool you, is what I'll say on that matter. And that's where there's got to be a level of where the, the buyer has got to take responsibility as well, because realistically, you, you've got hundreds, thousands of living bodies all pooing all eating every day, all potentially getting parasite bacteria and whatever, flies pooing on the water and whatever else goes on, there's a level where it comes down to the buyer. The buyer has got to take some responsibility in this. They can't just always blame the dealer. Um, six months on, 12 months on, saying, I bought a fish and now I've got a problem. Like, come on. Realistically, if you bought a car and 12 months later it broke, would you bring the person you bought it from? No, it, it, it doesn't work like that. There's only a set time that you can actually point fingers and then after that it comes more responsibility. And That's where I've got a lot of respect for Simon at Up North Koi Pond. Um, yeah. Hopefully you won't mind me talking about this. Obviously I know we've, uh, I say we've not spoken a well. while, we've only ever really seen each other at shows to be fair. Um, obviously he had a bacterial problem, he's still battling through it now. Unfortunately it doesn't look like his antibiotics that he's got oh, are working. But fair play to him, he literally went through his whole complete and utter system to find what was the root cause of that within his pond. Could it have been a fish that he added in from a different dealer? Yes. But he still went through and made sure, and obviously he found all that poo and detritus pumped up around the bottom um, of his outflow on the bottom of his moving boat. Instead of him just annihilating the dealer and keeping that to himself, he'd got the morals to literally put his neck on the line and go, you know what? 
this could have actually come from me. So I've it's gone it's through my whole pom problem here, and that's hard, why I touched it? about it, it, it on my other video. It's hard to sometimes say, I messed up, look, when I killed them 25 fish, I can mention it a, a little bit before, I got annihilated. People were like, oh, you should use C3-1, whatever. Yeah, I should have. I didn't know. I genuinely, it was a stupid mistake. I didn't know. I made a mistake, but I owned it. I could have... I could have just went, come down here, bought a load of fish, stuffed them back in, no one would have been any the wiser, and live and learn, but I didn't, I, I stuck it on YouTube, I put my neck on the line, and I got slated for it, um, I didn't want to kill 25 fish, there was no, I, I grew them fish from being fried to jumbo tosai, I was really, you know, when I say jumbo tosai, I mean they were well into the 20s, ACMs, 25s, some a little bit bigger than that even, so I was proud of myself for doing that. So I didn't want to kill them fish, but yet you still get annihilated because you put it on YouTube and you put yourself out there for the world to annihilate you, essentially. It's all breaking when you lose a fish. Yeah. To this day as a koi farmer, like, it's all breaking when I lose it. That had been the first time that I took fish from 10 cm less than that, maybe, and took them over to 25 plus cm. The Sorogoy, I went on about that Sorogoy, I, I was really proud of that fish. It was so big. Um, so it was devastating, like really devastating, and, and at one point that was sort of like a what's even the point, and we all have these moments, and anyone says they don't, you're lying, we all have these moments going, I can't do this, I don't know what I'm doing, yep. I'm going to pack it in, I'm going to give me fish away, I'm going to sell me equipment, blah blah blah, we wake up, tomorrow's a new day, um, and we live and learn, and that's what we've got to do, but we all have them moments. Mate, I've, I've had them 101 times, yeah. and it always comes at the worst possible time as well, like when you're going through something. And like, there's, there's one Japanese um, buyer, he's not even a dealer or anything like that. Um, he's a guy called Craig. I won't go into what his last name is, but this guy religiously tries to annihilate me online. And it's comments like Craig's and he's trying to annihilate me online. I'm trying to I'll just, <laughs> I'll, oh, I'll, show, I'll show you afterwards. You'll, you'll know it straight yeah, away. No, like, and he'll, he'll probably see his podcast. He'll probably, he'll, he'll probably avoid me at, at the shows like he normally does and stuff. And I've messaged him a few times in the past and said, look, come down the farm, we'll speak to me on the phone. Like, we, we can talk through whatever issues you've got, because clearly you've got one with me. But when I see the, like, the real shitty comments that he's putting online, I was having my darkest of days. I'd be like, you know what, I'm going to carry on for this guy, because I live in his head rent-free that much. Do you know what I mean? But I'm going to carry on for this guy. Like, this is the guy I'm doing it for. Like, now it's got to a point where, like, I read a negative comment like that, I'm like, okay, I'm clearly threatening a lot of these people by do what I'm doing. You, do you remember when I come down to yours with Becky and your mother-in-law was there and we were in the garage and you had the vats in the garage back then? Yes. And you showed me the messages? Yeah. And they were talking about your kids? And, yeah. And this is your story, so you tell this another time, but I'll, I'll unbelievable. Well, I'll, I'll like, touch on it briefly now, but I mean... Emails, <coughs> like, emails going off, at your family, I just couldn't believe it. I had an email off somebody saying, um, They'd, obviously, I, everybody knew that last year for Ernest Tristan's birthday, I went over to Poland with April and the kids because Ernest's birthday and the children's birthday is on the same date. And I'd had an email off somebody while driving down the autobahn. I'd pulled over and I'd just check my emails off and all me do. Uh, and it was an email that basically read along the lines of, do me a favour and, and crash that car on the drive back so there's, uh, there's no one to look after that pathetic uh, excuse of a koi farm when you get back. And that was with me and me uh, three kids in the back. That's <coughs> I've had I've had emails about about people saying horrible things about about the twins and stuff like that and about Brooklyn and stuff and they always hide behind like fake profiles and stuff and I've never publicly spoken about it like in this way and I, I think a lot of people just like really need to give their head a wobble like I I die for my kids the same as you would and same as most people watching this would as well but to go out of your way that much to put that much hatred into somebody. Like, I must be doing something wrong. Do you know what I mean? For me to sit there and rattle somebody that much, yeah, yeah, I must be doing something wrong. There's a, there's a level where, like, right or wrong, mistakes made on, on me, you, and everyone else. We get out there and we do it. We put ourselves out there. We get slaughtered by people when we do something wrong. We get praised when we do something right. The same people who praised us then slaughter us or we praise them when we do something wrong. Like, and we still put it out there. And I feel like that, that's... People need, need to, and, and look, the people who slaughter us are going to slaughter us regardless. I don't, get, I don't get a lot of it, 
um, but obviously I'm a lot, lot smaller than your channel, so I'm, I'm glad you don't though because time, do you know what I mean? genuinely the emails that I got would not wish I'm a worse enemy. No. Really, really would not because it, it's it's horrendous, man. Like say what you want about me, do you know what I mean? It's like was I have I made some mistakes in the past before when I mentioned like about the uh, this is guaranteed to get to a meter? Like yeah, I was laugh, that me? I laughed so hard after the But you said something but, stupid. Yeah, it is because I got is, caught up in the moment yeah. and I've seen the size of the parent fish. Now don't get me wrong, the parent fish aren't that big either. They're not. But for what it was at that time, for the age and the size of the fish that it was, it was just me being overzealous. Do I think it'd get there? No, I, absolutely not. No, was I wrong? Yeah. I uh, have a lot of people said, look, dude, just take it down, like, just hide from it. And I'm like, no, I made that mistake. And people can literally see my journey online from me go to complete novice to, like, intermediate slash advanced. Do you know thing what I mean? I said before, 18 minutes a day make it 95% better than anyone else in the world. That's a fact. You can look that up. So if you give, say, say 20 minutes for argument, say 20, 20 minutes a day, 365 days in a year, so what's that work out? Just a, what, 700 and, 750 um, hours a year, and, and you're better than 95% of the world, essentially, in that hobby. Like, we eat, sleep and breathe this now. Yeah, you know literally. What I mean? like, and there's I, nothing that anybody could do or say to, to stop me doing this, do you know what I mean? My mates are, are like, what? What are you doing? Like fish all day, every day, just fish, and they don't get it because they all go fishing and whatever. But they don't get it because I feel like once it bites you, the bug bites you, it takes over your life. Yeah. Honestly, it does. And quite addiction. Yeah. Definitely quite addiction is a thing. I can't see me never not on the pond now. And when I say one, I'm never happy with one. So I can't see me never having more than well at least three ponds. I think three is a, is a realistic number that you can you can grow on, you can quarantine, you can have your big fish, you can have your males and have your females, however you want to do it. So yeah, I'm always going to have ponds, I'm always going to have multiple ponds, and I hope it carries on, and I hope Mike takes over eventually, because they're all started with him. That's what I mean, it's, it, I'd love to see it now with the twins and that, like he's like Brooklyn when uh, when Vern was down with you, you guys the other day and that, and he was selecting his fish out, and Brooklyn was helping him select his fish and grade his fish, and a customer come down the other day, it was after a Kajaku and co I said, oh, it's in Pond 2 on the right, I'll show you where it is now, and literally pointed out the Kajaku to him. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's becoming second nature to the kids, and I think this is why I upset a lot of people in the industry, because it was always like, the, the kid in that scenario is now the Koi importers and the Koi dealers of the UK, yeah. whereas in the future, it'll be Mikey, it'll be Jack's Potter and Brooklyn, etc., etc. And I think a lot of people are like, well, what's giving me the right, you the right, to be able to just start a koi farm, start a koi dealership, do you know what I mean, start a koi YouTube channel. I think that's, what it comes down to, whatever anyone wants to say, you've got to set the balls on us big enough yeah, to do, just take on the it. challenge and just do yeah. it. And people can say we're winging it, we're doing this, whatever, but like... Somebody asked me the other day, I said, what would you do, Jack, if it ever failed? I said, oh my God, I would have the largest koi collection in England. Look at Literally, yeah. I'd have the largest koi collection in England. It, it never fail. Like, so you, you might one day go a farm. Not for me. I'm gonna I'm gonna hone it in. I'm gonna become a, the biggest dealer in the UK instead or whatever. It never fail in in the sense of like it all just finish. It just you might change and you might go. I don't want twenty five pounds and, and you know twenty thousand fish a year. I want to do it a different way. That's just time. That'll come with time, but. And the same with me, I'm saying I want to be a British koi farm. Having mud ponds and stuff like that, that maybe it might be hell on earth. I don't know, I'm going to have to discover that one day and then I might maybe go away from that, who knows. It's a learning curve to go yeah. through, it definitely is a learning curve to go through. But I'm enjoying the journey so far, I'm enjoying the people I meet. Um, koi people are weird. In a good way. In a good way, but they are weird. Like, you, you've got to admit, and any, any proper koi people have got to say, I'm weird. <laughs> it, it is. I'm weird. But it's... No, I'm, I'm definitely strange, um, but they're good people and they're really nice people and they're helpful people and yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. Gotta love the hobby folks, gotta love the hobby. Well, this typically the uh, good podcasts are only due to last an hour, typically mate, we're about an hour and a half to an hour and 45 at the minute. Um, 
but it is what it is. I've, I've, I've enjoyed every single uh, segment of it. Obviously, this is now officially going to be the first one uh, that's been released. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming oh, down. I think we'll uh, pick out your, uh, pick out your show as for you now. Um, and hopefully, obviously, people will see those on your open day. And obviously, I'll be there to sort of help support like you were here at mine as well. Obviously, we've got the show scene coming up and things like that. Really looking forward to the shows. Obviously, I can't go down to the uh, Newark show, so... Um, there's going to be a huge podcast update on that in regards to why I've not been allowed to go to the Newark show. So make sure you are subscribed along because, as you can probably tell, I've got to the point in uh, in my YouTube in uh, coin keeping now where I'm not keeping my mouth shut anymore, uh, and I'm just getting to the point where I'm just going to say what I see, uh, whether they like it or not. I've uh, bit my tongue for, for far too long, and I've, I've got that creative flair back now. I'm buzzing. I'm excited. I'm excited for what the future holds for the farm and stuff like that. And I've I've, I've kept quiet for long enough. And uh, I definitely don't think I'm going to be keeping quiet much longer. No, I wouldn't have been telling you for months, so just say what say it, but that's your decision to make, and when you do it, you do it. No, that's it. So make sure you subscribe along, make sure you subscribe along to Danny at My Bush Crew as well. Thank All of his good. details uh, will be in the video description and down it, below. I'm going to give a shameless plug. This is not profitable, by the way. I just give hours and hours of my day every day to UK Coy owners, but UK Coy owners is 28,000 members, 28,500 members now. Um, I think we're the biggest UK koi group and there's just so much help, advice, support on there. If, you do, if you're new to the hobby and you want some help, it's a Facebook group, go and check it out. As I say, it's not profitable for me in any way, it costs me money, um, but I really enjoy it and so do the members, so go and check that out as well. No, absolutely. Full details in the video description down below. Join us next Friday uh, for the next latest guest and if you do want to be part of it, um, drop me an email, Jack at Reefer Aquatic. Uh, no, it's not. That's no, the old not one. Woo! Not, not drop me an email, Jack at Reefer Oasis Koi Farm dot com. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Stay safe, stay sane, but most importantly, people, stay happy. Baldwin Reefer, out. <laughs>